And hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode uh, of CAFC Presents, uh, our ongoing web series of webinars. Uh, to the title of today's webinar is Transitioning Congenital Cardiac Patients and Their Families from Pediatric to Adult Services, and we're focusing on Quebec City's experience. And with us today, we have our presenter, Dr. Philippe Chetay, uh, from the Centre Marie Enfant at the Chouk in uh, Quebec City. And we also have with us uh, our CAFC liaison and the Chief of Pediatrics at uh, the Shook in Quebec City, uh, Dr. Marc-Andre Dugas. Uh, before we hand the pres or start the presentation, just a few uh, pieces of information. We do have uh, uh, the opportunity to have questions. And we, as always, if you've been on our webinars before, we uh, have sometimes have very long question periods at the end. And as usual, we will require you to type your questions in. You should see a little control panel on the right-hand side of your screen, and there's a little box there where you can uh, type your questions in. And I always recommend that you type your questions in as you think of them. Don't feel you have to wait until we call for questions at the end. Just type them in as you're, as you're thinking of them. Uh, and uh, also, as always, we record uh, all of our presentations, and the audiovisual recording will be made available on the Knowledge Exchange Network on the page uh, that you'll see in front of you. Uh, and we also make available any other resources that are made available to us from our presenters, such as PowerPoint slides and that sort of thing. If they're, uh, if they're able to share them, then we will certainly share them with you. Um, and a couple other things I just wanted to point out before we get started uh, is uh, this concept of transition is, of course, uh, of interest to a great many in the CAFC community, as is demonstrated by our, uh, the, the audience today. And it's constantly a topic uh, throughout our activities, whether it be at the CAFC conference, et cetera. So I just wanted to take the t the, this opportunity to point out the work that CAFC is doing in this area in our Pediatric Practice Guidelines Collaborative. We have a specific uh, community of practice around transitions from pediatric to adult care. So if anyone's interested, hopefully we have some of the folks from that community of practice online today that can help drive this discussion. And uh, But if anyone else is looking for more information on this work, on this community of practice, you can always go to the Knowledge Exchange Network uh, and to find more information about that. Um, so uh, that being said, I'd love to hand the uh, virtual podium over to uh, Dr. Marc-Andre Dugas, our, our CAFC liaison and the Chair of Pediatrics at the Shook, to introduce our presenter. Thank you. Over to you, Marc-Andre. Thanks, Doug. Um, and thank you all uh, for inviting us to participate in this uh, webinar. And as you just stated, the transitioning is effectively a problem affecting us all uh, for different reasons. Uh, might be resource utilization, uh, patient complexity. Sometimes it's a uh, medical knowledge of the receiving team that is a problem uh, for some uh, new uh, medical issues uh, uh, perceived as new in the adult uh, receiving team. Might be some patient factors, uh, which uh, Philip will uh, talk about. So um, I guess I, the problem needs to be addressed at the local and regional level, but um, webinars uh, such as these uh, can help us uh, share our ideas and, and our success stories. Um, we have in Quebec City, I think, two interesting models of uh, transitioning uh, at the site Mère Enfant du Chute Québec, which has a catchment area of about 2 million population. And uh, our two models of transitioning uh, are, uh, one is the uh, Cystic Fibrosis uh, Clinic, which is a uh, working very well uh, within the uh, uh, pediatric and adult world. And the other is uh, the congenital cardiac uh, patients. Um, unfortunately, we do not have a magical solution for all those transition problems, um, since in many areas we still do have problems in our own hospital, uh, as uh, everybody has. Um, but the, the, the focus of the webinar being the presentation of a successful uh, transition, it's a pleasure for me to introduce you to Dr. Philippe Sertai, uh, our pediatric uh, cardiologist who is responsible uh, for the uh, congenital uh, uh, heart clinic here in uh, Quebec City, uh, together with the, the uh, adult cardiologist. And Philippe was trained uh, uh, initially as an adult cardiologist in uh, France and then made his pediatric uh, uh, specialty. So he's uh, well um, knowledgeable in the issues uh, affecting uh, cardiac uh, issues uh, in children and in adults. So um, hopefully you will find this uh, presentation uh, interesting and uh, we will be able, available for uh, questions at the end. Well, thank you, uh, Marc-André. Um, uh, hello, everyone, and thank you uh, for um, the invitation to present today. 
So um, I'll try to, um, uh, to uh, go through uh, uh, different things about these uh, specific patients and about the specific issue of transitioning these patients from the pediatric to uh, the adult uh, world. So to start with, I have no uh, conflict of interest, but I wish I had some because uh, these patients are uh, somehow uh, the forgotten patients in the uh, cardiology, uh, adult cardiology world, world, you will see that these patients are not a very big number of patients if we compare with the adult uh, general cardiac uh, patients, but they are growing and they have specific issues. And just to mention, today is the International Day of Francophonie, but uh, relax, I'll try to do my best in, in English. So what I propose to do is to uh, first try to draw the characteristics of these, uh, this population. Uh, first, I would like to go through a few statistics to show you uh, what is that population in numbers and how it's growing. And I would like to talk a little bit about the problems of, of uh, loss to follow up of these uh, patients during uh, childhood, but also during uh, adulthood and mostly in between the two. Uh, and also, I would like to uh, mention the uh, high utilization of uh, health resources uh, by this, uh, this uh, specific population. I would like to go then through uh, medical, some medical uh, specificities of uh, this uh, adult congenital heart disease population. Then uh, we'll try to address uh, what, um, what kind of uh, transfer patterns we can see in the literature. And then uh, finally, I would like to focus on what we do in uh, Canada and then in the province of Quebec and a little bit, uh, I would like to focus on what we do in Quebec City. So to start with, I would like to go through numbers with you a little bit. And we have beautiful numbers in the province of Quebec, thanks to the, uh, uh, the, um, the, the team of Ariane Marelli, uh, who's working a lot with uh, her colleagues on very beautiful database and so we we're able to have very uh, uh, beautiful numbers for these patients in our province. So as you can see on this graph, uh, there is uh, for the adult and, uh, and the uh, pediatric population, the prevalence of congenital heart disease in these population are slowly growing up in the adult population and in the pediatric population. But if we just look at severe congenital heart disease, then what you can see is that over the years, there is a kind of a plateau for the number of pediatric patients with severe congenital heart disease. But for the adults, this is a growing population. It is growing so fast that uh, in, the, in the year 2000, and this is true for the province of Quebec, but it's also true for all Western uh, countries, the numbers, the number of patients in the adult world and in pediatrics are equal in the general population. It means that we have uh, as many patients with congenital heart disease that are adults and that are pediatrics children. And this is the another way to see the same thing. It is still in the same database. Uh, if you compare in 1985 and 1920, the mean age of these uh, patients with congenital heart disease, as you can see in 1985, their mean age was 11 years old, and in 19, uh, and in, in, 20, in the year 20, uh, 2000, I'm sorry, like 15 years later, the mean age is 17 years old. So this is uh, an increasing uh, mean age for this population, and as you can see, we're almost for that mean age going out of pediatric uh, uh, ages. So again, in that same database, the uh, uh, prevalence of congenital heart disease is roughly a little bit more than 1% in the children population. It is a little bit less than 0.5% in the adult population. And for the overall population, it's a little bit more than 0.5%. Uh, of, of uh, uh, person, uh, persons that have a congenital heart disease in the general population. And in numbers, 
these are numbers in the US and in Canada. And as you can see in the US, more than 800,000 uh, children and roughly the same number of adults have congenital heart disease. And in Canada, of course, numbers are not the same because of the uh, difference of uh, uh, population. But as you can see, we in the year 2000 have more adult patients than pediatric patients that have congenital heart disease. And why is this? Well, if you look at the uh, mortality curves in the province of Quebec, and this is in the year 87 to 88, as you can see, this is the black, the black line is the general population uh, mortality curve. And in yellow boxes, you have the, uh, the mortality numbers for patients with congenital heart disease. And as you can see, in those years, there was a high mortality during early uh, childhood, especially during infancy. Then there was a kind of a plateau for mortality during uh, uh, late uh, childhood and during early uh, adulthood, and then another peak in the 60s. If you compare that curve with a more recent one, uh, roughly 20 years later, this is, uh, this is still the general population mortality curve. And you can see that mortality during uh, infancy and during childhood is a lot uh, lower and that the mortality curve of this specific population is almost the same uh, as the uh, general population. And this is due to the fact that we have better uh, uh, diagnostic tools and we have, of course, better therape uh, therapeutic um, options for these patients with congenital heart disease. Now I want to address uh, another point, and this is a big issue in this population, the loss to follow up. Here we can see, and this is in the province of Quebec, still from the same, uh, same team and the same uh, database, and this is during adult uh, childhood. So as you can see, uh, even during childhood, uh, children can be lost to follow up during, uh, before the age of 18, especially when they have um, a simple shunts lesions, but still, when they have uh, when they have uh, lesions like conotrunchal anomalies, which are not benign, they can be very complex uh, diseases. You can have a significant number of loss to follow up by the age of 18. And if we look at the adult population, it's even worse. And these numbers are from our own uh, uh, heart surgery database in uh, Quebec City. Uh, in this database, when we exclude uh, uh, PDAs and aortic valve replacement before the age of 40, we have roughly, uh, we had by uh, 2008 roughly 3,500 uh, patients. Out of these, uh, a little bit more than 2,900 were alive. And as you can see, rough, uh, more than half of them were lost, uh, lost to follow up by the age of eight, uh, after 18, so uh, during adulthood. And uh, if you look at what kind of congenital heart defects were lots to follow up, of course, there are simple lesions and simple shunt lesions, but there are significant, uh, a significant number of complex diseases like tetralogy of follow transposition of great arteries. So this loss to follow up problem is a big issue in this population. The third thing I would like to uh, mention is that even if these, this population is not a big number of patients compared to other population like the uh, general cardiac adult uh, population, they are, uh, they are very big users of health services. This also is uh, our numbers from the province of Quebec. Uh, as you can see, these are uh, hospitalizations for a thousand persons for the uh, general population. And this is statistic, uh, statistically different from the population of uh, congenital heart disease with simple lesions. And this is even more uh, uh, different from the uh, patients with severe congenital heart disease. So the um, utilization of health system is very big for this population. And this is a way to look at the same uh, issue uh, as you can see here, this is the, uh, the uh, median 
the, the, the median numbers on a period of time of uh, five years. So 15 visits to the, their GP, 14 visits to their specialists, uh, three uh, uh, visits in the ER, uh, nine uh, hospitalization and five um, uh, hospitalizations, uh, hospitalization in uh, critical care units. So this is to stress, stress out that the fact that these patients, even though they are quite a small number, they utilize, uh, they, ut uh, they use the, uh, the, the health system a lot. Now, I would like to, uh, to go through uh, a few specificities of these patients. Uh, they have specific hearts, as uh, we'll see, specific extracardiac problems, and they have specific needs I would like to go through uh, very uh, briefly. They need special, uh, uh, specific doctors and they need specific healthcare workers. I don't want to go through all, kind, all the type of defects we encounter in this population, but I just want to illustrate the fact that these patients have uh, specific hearts and what we qualify uh, old hearts in young patients. And this is just uh, a figure from a publication uh, 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 from uh, Montreal. They studied um, uh, um, atrial arrhythmias in uh, uh, adult with congenital heart disease and as you can see, these patients, even though they're very young at 20 years of age, they have a risk of atrial arrhythmia that we could compare to the uh, risk of uh, general population at the age of 50 or even 60 years old. So their cardiac issues here illustrated are um, atrial arrhythmias are high and are as high as it would be in an, uh, a lot older general population. So this is why we used to say that these patients have old hearts in young patients. Now, I want to illustrate the fact also that uh, they have specific extracardiac issues and uh, uh, I want to go through a few slides to show what the problem of pregnancy can be. As you remember, this is a young population, so young women and uh, with uh, a will of uh, pregnancy. And of course, we're cardiologists. Pregnancy is not our main, uh, uh, we're not specialists of pregnancy, uh, but we have to uh, get a lot of knowledge of, on uh, pregnancy and the way the, the heart adapts during pregnancy to be able to, uh, uh, to give good advices and to, uh, and to uh, good, uh, give good care to these uh, women. So just to, uh, uh, refresh uh, with uh, numbers. Uh, in, two, in the year 2000, a little bit more than 5 uh, million adults in the uh, province of Quebec, and uh, so that is uh, more than 23,000 uh, adults with congenital heart disease, and more of half of these pa uh, patients are women, and young women's uh, so this is quite a, a significant number for the, a small province like Quebec. And of course, this does not include uh, ad uh, adolescents, girl, girls that could also have a pregnancies before the age of 18. So just to remind, me, remind you a few things, uh, during pregnancy, what are the causes of uh, death of these uh, women? This is a registry uh, from uh, the UK but that could apply, of course, to um, our uh, other Western uh, countries. And you can see that uh, cardiac issues are the main uh, causes of death during pregnancy for these women. And if we look into details, uh, we have here uh, the trend uh, over the years of that cardiac death during pregnancy. So this is just to mention that it's not an historical problem, it is still uh, a very up-to-date problem and it's even increasing in the last uh, decade. And if we get go into details into what causes uh, those uh, mo uh, cardiac mortality, of course um, ischemic heart diseases and uh, health, um, uh, cardiac insufficiency are uh, the main problems. But as you can see, congenital heart disease is not just an uh, anecdotal 
And if you add to that congenital heart disease, the numbers of uh, aortic dissection that can be encountered in, you, in our patients, like, like Marfan uh, disease patients, then you have quite a significant number that you can compare with other sources of uh, cardiac death in these uh, women. So what is the, uh, the risk for the mother during pregnancy? As you can see here, of course, the, uh, the, uh, the risk for the mother, it depends on the uh, cardiac defect she has. There are uh, 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 um, conditions that we well know, like Eisenmenger physiology, cyanotic congenital heart disease, that, ha uh, that have a huge risk, that are a huge risk for the mother during pregnancy. And these are arrhythmias, heart failure, or the cardiac, cardiovascular events. And what about the fetus and the newborn? As you can see here, when women have uh, cardiac issues, the number of issues for the fetus of, or the newborn, and we're talking about small for gestational age, uh, birth weight, and uh, respir respiratory distress syndrome, all other things, they're significantly higher than in the, uh, compared to the control uh, women. The risk for the fetus and the newborn are here again, uh, depend here again uh, on the uh, cardiac defect of the, uh, the mother. Uh, once again, the Eisenmenger syndrome, uh, cyanotic uh, uh, congenital heart disease are in uh, the, our top ranking for this, uh, these uh, problems. Sorry about this. But pregnancy uh, starts before pregnancy. And so we have to, uh, to uh, talk about uh, these issues with our young women, but also as pediatric cardiologists with our uh, adolescents. And we'll talk about this uh, uh, when talking about transition. We have to uh, now be pediatric cardiologists, not thinking about bringing our patient at 18 years old, this is not the goal. The goal is to make them survive as long as they, uh, well, not survive, but live as much as they can uh, through their adulthood with a good quality of life. So we need, with uh, in this specific issue, we need to talk with our adolescent girls about pregnancy and about having babies before they're able to, and before uh, they uh, get into uh, uh, discussion with the, uh, the uh, their husband or uh, loved ones. And as you can see, when we have to talk about contraception, uh, uh, we have guidelines to help us, and these guidelines are written by cardiologists. So, of course, uh, there are guidelines that were made uh, with the, uh, the help of, uh, uh, of specialists of contraception, but still, this is uh, publications to help cardiologists and congenital heart disease cardiologists to um, to uh, to talk to, with their uh, their uh, patients uh, about contraception, and also what we have to uh, talk about is the risk of transmission to the fetus of the congenital heart disease that the mother has or the father has. So as you can see on this uh, um, table, some congenital heart disease are have a high incidence of uh, uh, risk of transmission, uh, specifically if it's the mother that has the, the, the disease, the defect, and some other have uh, a low risk of transmission. But we have to, to talk with our patients, male and female, about the risk of transmission to their uh, future babies. Now these patients, they have specific uh, needs. As I was uh, uh, they have uh, specific needs uh, for physicians. They need specifically trained cardiologists with specific fellowship programs. They need, and this is one of the key things, a very good pediatric and adult uh, cardiologist collaboration. And we all need to develop very good networks uh, with obstetrics, pulmonary hypertension clinics, hematology, neurology. They have uh, social issues we need to address, like work issues. If we see these patients, most of, them, most of the time they're working. They have to take days off from their work to come to the clinic. If they have surgery or other 
uh, CAT or EP uh, studies, all these uh, things we need to do, they have to take uh, uh, days out of work. Uh, so these are uh, issues we need to uh, take into account. They have psychological uh, issues also. Uh, it is a lifelong illness like uh, all uh, these patients that um, were pediatric patients and then become adult patients. Sometimes we see in these uh, clinics patients that are like 40 years old and they are still coming with their parents because the parents are so were so involved in the uh, 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 therapeutic plan or, uh, of their uh, children that they still want to be uh, part of the team uh, when, um, when uh, their uh, uh, children become adults. So sometimes they, uh, they, they have the trouble to deal with that, uh, the, that uh, the presence of their parents and when they decide to come alone it, it, it is very difficult for them to take uh, um, to take uh, to make decisions on their own and they need other uh, healthcare uh, workers to uh, to uh, to take care of them so uh, seeing all this uh, in Canada there have been a lot of uh, statements over the years uh, to try to improve the quality of regionalized adult congenital heart disease care. Uh, I just uh, uh, listed three of them, like uh, in uh, 1988, care for adult congenital heart disease patients should be integrated with highly specialized such, uh, specialty care in regional ACHD centers. Judith Terrien in uh, 2001 stated that all C ACHD patients should be assessed at least once in uh, an ACHD uh, center. And more recently in 2010, Candice Selvesides uh, stated that uh, an approximate of 50% of these patients require ongoing expert care. So what can we do to try to uh, uh, transfer these patients? And as you know, there are two main concepts when we uh, decide to uh, transfer from pediatric to adult work. Uh, our patients. First, the first concept is transition, and I, uh, uh, I just uh, quoted two um, uh, sentences from uh, uh, publications that uh, were looking at that issue. So a transition uh, aims to um, uh, provide uninterrupted uh, health care that is patient-centered, age and developmentally appropriate, flexible, and comprehensive. So that means that we need to have extended and multifaceted uh, educational process that ideally begins in early by early adolescence and continues following transfer to adult care. So this again uh, points out the fact that it has to be a collaboration between pediatrics and adult uh, cardiologists. And the second concept, transfer, it is when the patient is di uh, discharged from pediatric care and referred to adult care. So what are the different uh, transfer patterns we can look at? I just, uh, here is a figure from a publication that addressed that uh, problem and, and studied uh, 69 uh, participating uh, centers in the US and, um, and, and looked at uh, the way they were transferring their uh, centers, there are pediatric cardiology, uh, cardiology uh, centers, how they were transferring their patients to uh, uh, adult uh, facilities, if so. So out of these uh, 69 centers, on, uh, 18 were not transferring their patients. So that, that is still the number of 26% uh, 26 uh, 26 of these centers that were not transferring their patients. 74% of these uh, 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 centers were transferring their patients, and that was because transfer was in half of these uh, centers uh, mandatory, but in half of them, it was just an op uh, optional. And um, if they were transferring, they were transferring mostly in 90% to an ACHD program, but in, uh, in, uh, in uh, a great, uh, great number that was still transferring to general cardiologists or to uh, the general community. Most of the time it was in the same location and sometimes it was in another uh, location. Uh, 
roughly 50% uh, of these uh, uh, centers were uh, using a predetermined uh, age to transfer these patients, and that was 18 years old. And uh, the, the other half uh, was using a range of age to uh, transfer these patients from uh, 15 to uh, 18 years old. So this is just to uh, point, out, uh, point out the fact that we don't have just one uh, pattern of transfer. No one has the, uh, the, uh, the holy grail uh, of uh, uh, how to transfer these patients. We all, as uh, Marc-André was uh, saying in introduction, introduction, everyone uh, tries to transfer uh, the patient the way they can. Uh, meaning, do they have a, a PDH, uh, do they have adult cardiologists uh, trained in adult uh, congenital heart disease? Uh, are the pediatric cardiologists trained in adult uh, cardiology? Uh, do they have facilities to do so? So it depends on a lot of things. And I thought that was interesting to mention. Uh, uh, there was a, a nice uh, publication done to uh, try to uh, uh, analyze what were the perceived, perceived uh, barriers to uh, adult congenital heart disease uh, transfer. And as you can see, these are the barriers that uh, were thought to uh, be the most uh, important for uh, uh, not transferring the, uh, the, the patient. And as you can see, most of these barriers are emotional barriers. So the parent or the patient, emotional attachment to the pediatric uh, provider can be also the pediatric provider that is attached to the family and the patient. And uh, the patient or the parent can be attached to the institution. And you can see that insurance issues and uh, medical uh, issues are ranking very low in these uh, perceived uh, barriers. So it's very interesting to see that em emotion is uh, highly uh, involved in uh, these uh, uh, barriers to transfer our um, pediatric patients to the adult world. Now I would like to uh, focus on what uh, is done in uh, Canada. Then I will go to the province of Quebec and then finally uh, to what we do in uh, Quebec City. So in Canada, there we have the CATCH network, which is a network of uh, uh, clinics, uh, adult uh, congenital heart disease clinic um, throughout the, uh, the country. And it's, uh, uh, sorry. And it was founded in 1981, which is uh, quite early in the uh, history of uh, congenital heart disease in adults. And it was it received affiliate st uh, status from uh, uh, with the uh, Canadian Cardiology Society, and because of that network, a lot of work was done. And especially, I think Canada was one of the first country uh, to be able to have uh, guidelines in the care for the care of adults with congenital heart disease. And uh, those guidelines were renewed uh, uh, peri uh, periodically. Also, at uh, the scale of the country uh, in Canada, we have a very good collaboration for research with many uh, uh, research that were public, uh, published over the years. Now, focusing on the province of Quebec, uh, this is a, a slide that I took from uh, Ariane Marelli. Uh, Ariane Marelli and her group in Montreal uh, uh, our, um, have been working a lot on a uh, database, and this, uh, this database is at the base of all the publication I showed you uh, in the beginning of the presentation, and uh, from which uh, all those beautiful numbers on the uh, population of uh, congenital heart disease in adults were drawn. So uh, what she and her uh, team did, uh, they uh, went through database, uh, medical claims database, hospital discharge uh, database, and Quebec Death Registry. They uh, encoded all the, the uh, diagnoses and uh, uh, therapeutic um, uh, uh, things that were done uh, with the ICD-9 uh, codes. They applied a lot of algorithms that I'm not sure I could uh, detail here, 
as I just don't understand a thing about these uh, algorithms, but uh, then they have that beautiful database they're working on uh, and have a, a lot of things to, uh, to tell us about. And I think those numbers uh, from the province of Quebec are quoted uh, all around the world because I think they're very, uh, they're very nice, they're very accurate, and um, also they represent very well what uh, the situation is uh, in uh, most of uh, uh, Western countries. Also, uh, in the province of Quebec, we collaborate a lot uh, between centers uh, on uh, research studies. And uh, as you can see through these two collaborations at the scale of Canada and uh, uh, the province of Quebec, we, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we emphasize on the fact that uh, we are all quite small, some, some are bigger than the others, small centers, and if we want to know and learn about this, uh, this population, we need to collaborate and, uh, collaborate and exchange uh, IDs, numbers, and uh, do our research uh, programs uh, to make sure that we uh, learn the more that we can from this population to serve it well. Also, in the province of Quebec, we are working very hard on developing uh, the um, uh, database, which is also an electronic chart, so that's the Congenerate uh, project, and it is very well advanced. We are uh, almost uh, able to uh, use it on a clinical, um, uh, a clinical um, uh, day uh, uh, used, and uh, this is. Uh, really dedicated to congenital heart disease patients, pediatrics and adults. And uh, it should be a very powerful tool for clinicians and also for research uh, when it's gonna be uh, uh, done and if uh, many centers uh, want to use it. it. Also at the scale of um, uh, the province of Quebec, we have a foundation which is named Ancoeur which is dedicated to patients, children, and adults with congenital heart disease, uh, disease throughout the, uh, the province of Quebec. And uh, its goal is uh, to uh, uh, support, uh, to do uh, su uh, educational uh, supports, to, uh, to have uh, financial support, psychological support, and fundraising. Sorry. So in Quebec City, we have two different worlds, that is the pediatric hospital and the adult cardiology hospital. But we only have one clinic, and this is a clinic of congenital heart disease in adults. Why do we have only one clinic? Because as I showed you, we realized that we had a lot of loss to follow up. Uh, we have an increasing number of adult patients and a population with really specific issues. And on the other hand, uh, we have two well collaborating pediatric and adult congenital uh, cardiac structures. And the province of Quebec has a few specificities. It's a wide uh, province and people coming to uh, our clinics uh, in Quebec City might have to travel like two days to come to the clinic because they're coming from uh, long distances away. And to uh, try to uh, minimize this uh, uh, distance issue, we uh, are doing quite a lot of outreach clinics. And we also developed a very well um, uh, functioning telehealth system. But the good thing, even if it's wide, it's, it has an historical French speaking population, which means that in Northern America, it is roughly the only place where uh, the, uh, the main language is uh, French. So that means that if you have a patient that you lost to follow up like 20 years ago, you're pretty sure that you might be, you, you will be able to reach that patient, that same patient at the same address he had 20 years before. People are not moving a lot throughout the province. So 
it is not such a big issue to uh, track patients even if you had uh, a lot of follow up, uh, a loss to uh, follow up. So, how did we uh, do this? How do we do this? We prepare our patients during uh, child, uh, childhood, so we do a, a transition. Uh, we don't have a former, formal uh, transition written program, but we all, as pediatric cardiologists, transition our patient quite soon during adolescence. And to avoid the loss of follow up, we educate them a lot by explaining their, uh, uh, their heart defect. First to the patients when uh, to the parents. I'm sorry when uh, when the, the the patient is not able to uh, understand his uh, uh, defect. But then we take a lot of time to explain to the patient what is his heart defect to make sure that he understands well why he has to be followed on uh, in cardiology and even uh, when uh, he's not a is is not going to be at home with his parents anymore. We reassure our parents, uh, uh, we do our um, outreach clinics, and as I was mentioning, tele uh, clinics. And we try to have a dedicated env uh, environment in the uh, cardiology uh, depart uh, hospital. It is the same medical team. And as I was mentioning just before, the emotional uh, issues can be the main issues for transferring the patients. So, what we do is when we transfer our patient, it is the same pediatric cardiology, the cardiologist that is going to follow his own patient in the adult world, at least for the few first appointments, and then he might, uh, the patient might be followed by another uh, cardiologist uh, because the pediatric cardiologist uh, wants to uh, focus his uh, uh, main uh, clinical time on uh, children, of course. It is the same surgical team. I'm going to show you this a little bit later on. And uh, we have a very well collaborating uh, adult medical specialists in the uh, cardiology, adult cardiology hospital. So the clinic, it's one clinic. We have three half days uh, a week, so that, uh, that is uh, three clinics a week. It is a teamwork, and the main person in this team is the full-time dedicated nurse practitioner. She assists to all clinics. She does all the follow-up uh, on exams, appointments. She is the main contact person for the patients. The patients have her own uh, phone number at hospital. They don't have to go through the uh, uh, general um, uh, system of the hospital. She organizes, uh, she is the one who, t who keeps updated the list of medical surgical rounds and uh, keep tracks of what uh, uh, was said during these uh, rounds. She, uh, she participates to the patient education. She had a, a special training for this. She uh, is working on the health passport every patient has. We also have a half-time secretary, and this is important also because uh, the patients are not calling the general appointment system of the hospital. They're, they're talking to uh, the secretary that is uh, only working for this uh, clinic, and we have um, a, a callback system, meaning that the patients don't have to call for their appointment. The secretary would call them uh, at the time of uh, uh, when the appointment has to be uh, booked. We have dedicated echo text that we trained. And of course, there is a dedicated uh, medical team. And it's a mix of pediatric cardiologists and adult cardiologists who uh, all had special training. And um, at each clinic, we have a mix of both. There is one uh, cardiologist in the echo lab and one in the clinic. And it is almost uh, every time uh, a pediatric cardiologist and an adult cardiologist working together. We tried to do the all-in-one day concept. Once again, these are young patients. Uh, they have uh, long distances to travel. So they come the same day to the clinic. They have their pacemaker checked if, if needed. They have their imaging uh, done. They have their exercise testing. And they even have their appointment in other clinics if needed, like seeing the surgeon, the, the pulmonary hypertension clinic, hematology, neurology, and so on. 
uh, we view the echo uh, on the on a specific system in the uh, clinical room, so we're able to see uh, in real time the echo of the patient we uh, clinically uh, see. And we have a single chart for pediatric and adults, and uh, these are for now uh, paper charts, but uh, we are now uh, evolving to a database as uh, I was showing you um, with the Congenerate project uh, just um, before. This is the uh, referral um, uh, sheet we have. So every uh, physician in our territory uh, can have access to that uh, specific uh, sheet and uh, to, uh, to ask for a uh, clinic appointment uh, in Quebec City. On the back of the sheet, we have, uh, sorry, but it's in French, but uh, in, uh, we have uh, listed all the conditions uh, that would prompt uh, uh, a visit to the clinic, at least for an assessment. And as I was showing you uh, a little bit uh, earlier, maybe for half of these patients, a follow-up uh, in this clinic. So children and adults uh, for surgery are uh, operated on by the same surgical team. Uh, the only difference are anesthesiologists, which are different in the pediatric and adult hospital. And they are uh, operated uh, in the two different hospitals to make sure that uh, they uh, benefit from uh, the pediatric environment for the, the children, like uh, pediatric intensive care unit, uh, pediatricians to uh, take care of other extra cardiac problems, and same thing for the, uh, the adults in their own hospital. But it's the same surgical team, team they're traveling between the two uh, uh, hospitals. For CAT, uh, uh, for CAT uh, we have uh, interventional and diagnostic CAT all in the pediatric hospital except for uh, percutaneous valve that are done in the uh, adult uh, cardiology uh, department. And for uh, electrophysiologic um, uh, procedures, it is a collaboration between pediatric uh, cardiologists and, uh, and the EP team for all EP studies in the, uh, in the pediatrics and adult uh, congenital heart defect. The pediatric electrophysiologist, which is uh, Jean-Marc Coté, uh, is always the uh, number one person doing the, uh, the study or the ablation, but he uh, always do this in the uh, setup of the adult uh, hospital with the adult EP team. Of course, uh, the clinic has uh, specific connections with other specific clinics. So uh, it is a small number of patients in the clinic but they are very complex patients. So what we, were, uh, what we wanted to do by seeing these patients at a single clinic, but doing procedures at different hospitals to get the expertise of these specific hospitals was for them to be seen and managed in high volume and expertise, uh, expertise uh, centers. We really need to advertise for these uh, kind of clinics. We need the uh, patients to know about this, uh, the, uh, this clinic, and we need the, uh, the, the physicians to know about this clinic. So we need to uh, advertise. And just to, uh, uh, to mention this uh, anecdote, uh, we had a patient. This is the front page of Le Soleil, which is one of the uh, uh, Quebec City's newspaper, daily newspaper. Uh, 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 the patient on the picture is a 43-year-old who was operated on for, uh, uh, for um, an um, aortic stenosis at the age of 14 years old. And uh, it was lost to follow up like a year or two after uh, his uh, surgery. And at 43 years old, he uh, was driving on the highway with his wife and, um, and a kid in the back of the car and had a sudden death. Hopefully, uh, his wife was able to park the car and he was resuscit uh, resuscitated and he was operated on. And that is the day he came out of hospital. He specifically asked us to call um, uh, the media to, uh, to tell his story. He said, I was stupid not to, be, uh, uh, to, not to uh, contact my doctor to be followed. And I want my uh, example to be an example for other patients not to do the same uh, thing uh, I did. So he left uh, hospital uh, on a Wednesday 
and that is the day uh, he was interviewed in newspapers and uh, on radio and TV, local radio and TV. And by Friday, so that less than three weeks after, we had had uh, 150 calls from patients all over the province that would co they were uh, calling to have uh, an appointment for a visit in the clinic. And in these patients, there were uh, 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 simple defects, but there are a, a number a great number of uh, complex lesions like transposition of great arteries, tetralogy of follow, common IV canal, that had no follow-up on their uh, congenital heart uh, issues. And we even had uh, calls from abroad of uh, uh, Quebec um, uh, people, uh, uh, Quebecois that were living abroad uh, in Spain or in Europe, uh, the rest of Europe, and uh, so it is just to mention that we have to advertise and uh, we have to uh, make these clinics to be known by patients and by physicians. And beyond the clinic, there is, of course, research, fellowship programs. As I was mentioning, we need to train our pediatric cardiologists and adult cardiologists, future colleagues. Uh, they need to be trained for this, uh, these uh, specific issues. So to conclude, uh, adult congenital heart disease uh, patients it is a growing population and as every uh, spe uh, spe uh, specialty in pediatric cardiology we need to fa face that issue that our pediatric patients are growing up are becoming adults and they need to have a place to go when they get adults with their specific problems there in, uh, as I was saying, there is a need for a lifelong follow-up. And I did mention it when uh, doing my talk, but there are still a lot of things we don't know about these patients. These and their hearts. These patients, the, the, the pediatric cardiology is quite a new specialty. And what was done 40 years ago is not what we do today. And we don't have any patients that are uh, 70 or 80 years old that were operated on as newborns. So our patients nowadays are new patients and they are the uh, adults of tomorrow and we don't really know what they're going to be when they get adult. We hope they're going to be well but we don't know everything about their hearts. If we want to be able to give them the best uh, follow-up and service uh, we can. We need to follow our populations of adults to learn from them and to apply what we've learned to uh, uh, our young uh, population and even to our uh, pediatric population. They have specific issues and needs and transition and transfer programs are mandatory. The key, to my, in my opinion, is a good collaboration between pediatric and adult cardiologists. And once again, this is a, a, a teamwork. So I would like to thank you to thank uh, all the, uh, the, the the persons in the team. And this is the five pediatric uh, cardiologists in uh, Quebec City. These are uh, uh, adult cardiologists that were uh, specifically trained in uh, congenital heart disease. Uh, this is one of our surgeons, and this is our uh, nurse practitioner and um, uh, secretary. So. Thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any questions, I'll be uh, uh, glad to uh, take them. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Shatai. That was a fantastic presentation, and just a reminder to, uh, to the audience, uh, you know, this is your opportunity to ask uh, any questions, type them into the, into the box, but, you know, what an incredible comprehensive uh, story and, and, and program. I mean, to start with, you know, identifying the, the incredible advances that have been made in, in in congenital heart defects and treating them in infancy and, and young children and, and these children are, are living this long. I mean, those graphs that you showed at the beginning are, are success is part of the problem and that these children are continuing to live into adulthood now. I mean, it's just really an incredible story and the, the comprehensiveness when you when you started to add in that piece about the advocacy and the advertising and and uh, engaging with these people who have left the system and are, and are not being followed up. I mean, that's a, it really shows the, the comprehensive approach that uh, you've taken with this program. I think it was really fantastic. So, well, um, thank you. Yeah. Um, so we're just uh, we don't have any questions uh, yet. I think people are still digesting and uh, and 
maybe their fingers are flying on the keyboards right now as they're thinking of their questions. But uh, Doug, it's Elaine. I, I I have a couple of um, couple of comments and and a question or two, if I may. Maybe I can kick it off. I'm gonna have. A, I'm gonna pose a challenge for our. Um, for our colleagues who have joined us uh, from across the country this morning on the webinar as well. Um, Dr. Shatai, I just want to, as Doug said, I, I too want to thank you for this outstanding presentation. Um, I'm very, I was disappointed when, when you stopped because I was very much wanting more and more information. Um, I think that, um, you know, you, you've hit on so many points. Um, you know, 50% of, of patients requiring ongoing care um, from a generic perspective, almost regardless of, um, of the condition. You know, when, when we think about transition, I think that's, that's, a, that's a, a very um, significant uh, statement and, and fact if you will, not, not, not just the 50% being a very large number, but just the realization of the, uh, of, of the um, numbers that require follow-up. Um, your particular model, um, you know, you, your slide was very powerful where you showed the Centre Mère et Enfant, the Children's Hospital in Quebec City, and then you showed the Adult Center under Shook but you have one clinic that everyone goes to. And, and the fact that your pediatric cardiologists follow and, and follow these patients at least for the first several um, appointments. So um, as, as, they, as they transition to adulthood, um, this, these are all, I'm gonna say, very unique and um, um, definitely reasons for success of your program and, and another reason we're so glad that you shared it. When you, when you talked about the, um, the former patient, the now 40 plus year old man who provided that testimonial and subsequent to that you had 150 um, uh, calls and, and, and uh, individuals sort of wanting appointments that struck me as a um, little bit of um, it was there a capacity issue like do do you have the capacity to um, to follow up you know that many more patients without you know obviously this is this isn't part of your your initial plan can you comment on on the capacity issue and and how you deal with that yes um... Thank you for the question. And uh, roughly in the uh, in the clinic, we're seeing as you as you saw by the uh, the numbers I showed uh, on Quebec City at the end of the presentation, uh, we're not a very big center. We're a mid-sized center, and this is also why we need to get organized because uh, we need to uh, uh, we don't have the power of uh, very big centers like, for example, in Toronto. And we need to get organized, and sometimes it's more of a homemade uh, system. But still, uh, if you have a good people working together, you get to do very good things. And we're very proud of what we're doing because I think those. Uh, if we look uh, in ten years, when uh, we'll be able to uh, look back at what we did, I think that fifty percent of loss to follow up is going to uh, decrease a lot. Just to uh, uh, to comment on what we uh, what you said, uh, roughly we see uh, 1,000 patients a year in the adult uh, cardiology uh, clinic, and um, uh, one of the uh, my uh, colleague in cardiology uh, uh, is uh, quite a young colleague. She's a cardiac um, she's a cardiologist, adult cardiologist, and she went to train for three and a half years in congenital heart disease in London, in, uh, in the UK. And um, we were waiting for her to come back uh, to be able to uh, grow a little bit uh, in, uh, for the clinic. So what we did is uh, we, uh, uh, we had uh, two days a week at that time, well, two half days a week at that time for the clinic. And we were keeping adults in the pediatric uh, uh, clinics uh, 
uh, and so pediatric cardiologists were uh, still seeing those uh, patients because we didn't have the power to uh, be able to see these patients, uh, the manpower uh, specifically, uh, to see these patients in the adult clinic. So when she, when she uh, came back, then we had a third clinic. We, we uh, begin to, trans uh, to transfer these patients from the, uh, the patients we were still retaining in the pediatric clinics. We, try, uh, we begin to transfer them to the adult uh, clinic. And uh, we knew that we had to go for, uh, uh, and advertise this uh, clinic, but we were waiting uh, to be uh, sure because we were sure that we would have a lot of calls after advertising like we did. So we were waiting uh, to be sure that we will be able to see these patients. Of course, we didn't see all these patients the week after, but we were able to see these patients in the few year, uh, in the few uh, weeks uh, after we. Uh, oops. Sorry. Can you hear me, still? Yes, absolutely. Uh, there's someone who connected to. Um, okay. And um, uh, so we were waiting to make sure that we will be able to see these patients uh, in, a, in a few uh, weeks or a uh, month of time. And this is what we did. The, the, the story I was talking about was uh, in, um, it was more than a year ago. And so far we, uh, we've seen everybody, uh, I think in, in, a, in, in, a, in a roughly six months. And, and this is to, to point out also the fact that the, uh, the, the, the nurse has a, a huge role, uh, plays a huge role in these uh, issues that, because she's calling back the patients and asks them what their heart defect is. She collects all the uh, medical data if the patient is coming from another hospital uh, and so forth. And then she's able with us to uh, prioritize the patient. And so we saw the patient that had to be seen in first, first and then uh, the other patients that were not that uh, urgent, we saw them a few months after. So we were able to do that, but just bef because we anticipated that we, sh we would have a lot of calls. And so we were waiting for the time that we will be able to, uh, to see these patients. Okay, excellent. Desert, are there, are there some questions waiting? Yes, we did have a question come in. Um, Megan has asked, how are connections established with other clinics within the hospital and out in the community? For example, allied healthcare services, et cetera. Um, what, uh, what we did is uh, the, 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 the clinic, the adult clinic, the, the adult congenital heart disease clinic uh, is uh, part of uh, specific clinics in the uh, uh, cardiology departments. These clinics are mostly uh, surgical clinics uh, like um, aorta diseases and um, and so on so specific clinics uh, within the outpatient clinic uh, in the um, uh, cardiac hospital it is hospital uh, laval uh, the, the, the the adult hospital is a huge uh, cardiac hospital adult adult cardiac hospital and pneumology uh, hospital they have uh, 2,000 uh, pump cases uh, a year in cardiac surgery. It's a very big hospital. And so because we, uh, uh, we joined that group of um, uh, specific uh, adult cardiac and surgical clinics, we uh, can be part of their network and, uh, and, uh, and uh, their connections to uh, all the clinics I was talking about. A specific connection had to be made, uh, made uh, with uh, obstetrics. And this is, uh, the, the, the good thing about this is that because we're coming as pediatric cardiologists from the uh, uh, Children's Hospital, that, that is a mother and a child hospital, uh, we know very well the obstetricians. So we developed a very good link uh, uh, between the uh, adult congenital heart disease clinic and the uh, high-risk uh, pregnancy uh, uh, service in uh, the other hospital, but it is easy for us to make the link because we're from that hospital too. All right. 
Uh, we have passed uh, the hour here, so uh, for the audience, uh, for those of you uh, that are out there, um, we will take any questions that come in in the next few seconds, but while we're waiting for any uh, any, any last-minute questions, maybe we'll just um, go over to uh, Dr. Shatai for any... Do you have any final comments or any, any, you know, anything you'd like to close off with while we're waiting for any final questions here? Well, I, I think, once again, this is, uh, when you look at numbers, uh, uh, these numbers are not that big, especially if you uh, compare to uh, the adult uh, uh, cardiac uh, general population. But these uh, patients are very demanding. They're very complex patients. And just for uh, 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 an example, uh, as a pediatric cardiologist, when I do uh, my clinic, I see in a half, in a, in a, uh, in a clinic, I see like 14 patients. That's a half day uh, clinic. When I do the exact same clinic as I'm gonna do this afternoon in the adult hospital, for, uh, so the, the exam same clinic for adults, I see half the number. It's seven to eight patients maximum. And this is not because I'm uh, slower with adults. It's not because it takes, um, it's just because they are very, very complex patients. Most of these patients, and that's a big issue in the province of Quebec, don't have uh, a GP. So uh, we are doing also all the other, uh, we're dealing with the other uh, issues they might have. So there are very complex patients. And as I pointed out during the uh, presentation, they use the help resources a lot. And we are here just to help them to uh, use these resources the best uh, we can and the best they can. So once again, this is not the number, it's the complexity of these uh, patients. And I think as pediatric cardiologists, we have the, uh, the, uh, the task to uh, take care of these adults patients, or at least to, uh, to uh, be sure that these patients are not going to fall without any uh, follow-up when uh, 18 years old and more. We need to transition them. We need to make sure that they have a we have a transfer system. Do we, are, are we part of the transfer system? This is the way we work in uh, Quebec City. A lot of uh, other clinics might not take their pediatric cardiologist as part of the uh, adult team, but still the pediatric cardiologist has to be uh, aware of the uh, HCHD program and must be part of the transition and transfer uh, program. And I think this is true for pediatric cardiology. That is true for a lot of uh, pediatric special, uh, specialties. And as we're getting better and better in the uh, care of our uh, pediatric patients, and particularly in, uh, in uh, complex diseases uh, uh, at the age of uh, in, in pediatrics, we need at the same time to be better in transferring their, our patient in the, in the uh, adult world and to make sure there is a transfer um, uh, system and program uh, for these patients not to uh, fall uh, without any follow-up uh, uh, when they get uh, 18 and more. Okay. I have one final question come in uh, and we'll just, uh, we'll take this question and then we'll be done. Um, the last question was, uh, what are your thoughts towards sustainability for this clinic, uh, as particularly as client numbers grow and particularly looking at funding issues, if any, and any staffing issues need for increasing staff hours or staff numbers? I mean, you know, your thoughts around sustainability going forward. Yes, I'm, I'm very optimistic uh, because uh, in, um, and once again, I, uh, I'm speaking about what I know, uh, uh, meaning uh, Quebec City's uh, system. Uh, we have a very, very, very good collaboration with the adult cardiology uh, department. And uh, they realize that it's not a big clinic, it's not a big number of patients, but they realize that it's, the, um, it's one of the mission of the uh, uh, tertiary uh, uh, cardiac center to be able to take care of these patients. So we, uh, they uh, were very comprehensive and they were very, uh, they, they really, uh, gave us a lot of resources, uh, meaning echo resources, echo machines, uh, echo text uh, training, and um, Elizabeth Bedard I was talking about, uh, who's um, an adult uh, cardiologist, uh, went to get her training in, uh, for uh, several years in, uh, in London, and that was part of uh, a global uh, thinking 
uh, about uh, the taking care of these uh, patients. Um, we don't have uh, um, uh, big uh, financial uh, issues as long as the uh, cardiac, uh, the, uh, as long as the adult cardiac program supports us. Uh, we're part of the the the, the, the program, and we also uh, we're also part of the, uh, uh, the, the the fellowship program uh, for uh, teaching to uh, adult cardiologists and pediatric cardiologists for the taking care of these patients. So I'm very very optimistic, uh, at, at least in uh, in Quebec City. And just to mention, uh, uh, in North America, now, U.S. and Canada. Uh, there, it's it's all new. And there's going to be uh, a board uh, certification for uh, adult congenital heart disease uh, uh, adults. Uh, well, adult taking care of uh, congenital heart disease. So there is, um, I think, at all level, uh, uh, people are realizing that these patients are here. They are here to stay. They are even here to grow and they need resources. And I'm very optimistic that uh, we've been heard. Uh, what, when I say we, it's uh, pediatric cardiologists and patients, and, uh, the, and that uh, we are gonna be able to uh, grow as the population grows. Excellent. Perhaps, Doug, I just wanna throw in one more comment and invitation. Um, Dr. Shatai, it would be wonderful if you and your colleagues would consider um, becoming part of CAFC's uh, transitions community of practice, um, we can you know we can share a lot more information um, with you after this after our webinar today, of course. But um, I feel that you would have so much to bring to that, and uh, and perhaps a wonderful uh, exchange with uh, with other colleagues from across the country. I'll be glad to. Thank you. All right. Well, that would be that would be great to have you more involved because it was a fantastic program. You've really brought a lot of great information and uh, and just the stories and the experience that you brought to this uh, has been fantastic. Um, so with that, we'll wrap it up. Uh, you know, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shatai and Dr. Duga and uh, the rest of the colleagues that you had in the room with you from uh, the Centre Marie Enfant at the CHU de Quebec. Um, it was great having you here, and thank you for giving us the time and, and the expertise. And thank you to uh, everyone out in the audience who joined us today. Uh, as always, we uh, do these uh, webinars uh, every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Usually, uh, we do have our patient safety webinars uh, the fourth Friday of the month as well that we that we broadcast here and host on the uh, Knowledge Exchange Network. Um, so, but if you're always if you're ever looking for information about CAFC Presents and the webinar series, you can go to our website uh, in the Tools and Resources section and you can always see the calendar which shows all of the upcoming webinars. So we do have the Patient Safety Webinar this coming Friday and then we do have a couple weeks off where we uh, are taking a bit of a break and then we'll, we'll, we will be coming back on April 10th with a presentation from our colleagues at the London uh, Health Sciences Centre uh, Children's Hospital on their pro bono uh, legal, uh, their medical legal collaboration pro program where they have a pro bono law office uh, and we're having colleagues from sick kids and from London Health Sciences Center uh, bringing their information on that so uh, as always you can find the information there and you can always sign up for it to receive the email notifications uh, through the link on our website as well um, so once again thank you to our presenters and, and to all of the audience and hopefully we'll see everyone on our next webinar goodbye everyone thank you goodbye bye bye